Hi everyone, I'm going to start a new topic, chemical equilibria, or just equilibrium for short, right? So remember uh, at the start of the semester I said basically we got three topics. <laughs> yes or no, will the reaction work, which is thermodynamics, which is our next big topic, okay? Kinetics, how fast will the reaction go, which we finished now. And then uh, the last one here in our list is... Uh, Chemical equilibria, how much? Okay, so what chemical equilibria tells you is how much you will make from a process, okay? You don't necessarily turn 100% of reactants into 100% of products. Sometimes there's kind of a mixture of reactants and products left at the end of a reaction, which is so-called position of equilibrium, okay? So we're going to look at that ratio of, you know, products and reactants at the end of a process as defined by equilibria. Okay, now a nice way to think about this <laughs> is with an example, all right? So back in, uh, I think it was 1999, I found myself in uh, Vancouver on New Year's Eve, Vancouver in Canada, right? Okay, which is kind of cool, right? So I celebrated New Year in Vancouver. And the next morning, walking around down to downtown Vancouver, and in Canada, New Year's Day is the day of a big shoe sale. Well, most sales, actually, right? So everything's on sale on New Year's Day. And we came across a shoe store, right? And the big signs in the windows, like, you know, 70% off, right? And the shoe store kind of reminds me of an equilibrium. Let me explain why. Okay, so I'll draw you a picture, right? Okay, so here we have, let's call it like one minute before the shop opens, right? We have five customers waiting eagerly. <laughs> to get into the shoe store, right? Okay. Now I'm going to draw draw the shoe store like this. It's got it's got to have. It's very important that you understand this concept. You know when you go into um, you know, my local Jewel has a revolving door. So does my local Mariano's in Shorewood, right? Okay. So imagine a revolving door, right? Okay. That's important, as we'll see later. That actually represents something in equilibrium, which we'll get to. Okay. Here's the shoe store, right? <laughs> and here are the here are the shoes, right? Now, so before they unlock the door, if you like, these are reactants and these are products, right? So before we even start the reaction, we just have a bunch of reactants that haven't turned into products yet. As soon as they become, you know, shoppers inside the store, they're, you know, it's like, they're, like their products, right? Okay. So here we are. Okay, so we have our situation. All reactants, no products at the start of any reaction yet. And then you kind of pour them into a vessel, they start to react. You make products from reactants, and we saw that with the kinetics work at a certain speed. Then when that kinetics plot goes flat, right, so if you think about it, kinetics plot will eventually go flat, yeah, that's when, as we'll see in a moment, there's an equal rate of reaction between forward and reverse, all right? So there's still exchange between reactants and products, it's just at the same rate, so it looks like there's a fixed amount of each, right? Okay, we'll get to that. So. 901, the reaction starts. Reactants start turning into products, right? Okay, <laughs> kind of reminds me of my brother. My brother is actually involved in nightclub security. He's one of those people who stands outside a nightclub and doesn't let you in, and he looks like he's carrying two invisible beach balls the whole time. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> right. Okay, so here he is, right? <laughs> and what he does you can't come in, right? So he has to maintain only a certain number of people in the store. So what he does, right, he lets three people in the store. You've seen it, right? Maximum occupancy, however many people. So three people can go in the store, yeah? So we've started the reaction. We started to go that way, right? So we turn reactants into products, yeah? And that happens until you get like the maximum amount of products, yeah? Which is actually three people in, inside the store with some left outside, and that's a ratio, right? Then what happens is, <laughs> he doesn't let this next person in, sorry, can't come in, right? But when does that person come in? Well, as one person goes in, as one person goes out, right? So there's a, an exchange at this point, right? So when we've reached the right ratio, there's exchange, right? So what we have at equilibrium, we have always three people in the store. So if you like, there's always three products, right? But as one person leaves, one enters, yeah? So it's like the revolving door. So as you think about two people in a revolving door at the same time, right? As one enters, one leaves. 
because it's a straight swap one for one, there's always the same number inside as outside, and that's called the equilibrium position. Okay, so then we have a fixed ratio of products to reactants. We have established equilibrium. Okay, so reactions move with a certain speed towards the equilibrium position. Once the equilibrium position is established, three to two in this case, then we get exchange at the same rate. So it looks like there's always a fixed number of reactants to products, fixed ratio I should say, and that's the equilibrium position. Okay, so that's equilibrium in a nutshell, right? Okay, now let's put it kind of into a more um, chemical sense, right? Okay, so <clears throat> as we mentioned, so products and reactants have fixed amounts or molar ratios at equilibrium. It was three to two in our simple example. It might be three moles of product for two moles of reactant, for example, right? Okay. And that's maintained because the forward and reverse reaction rates are identical. As reactant turns into product, product turns into reactant at the same speed. So we have a fixed ratio of products to reactants. Okay. Now, here is <laughs> a picture of the LA <laughs> skyline from the 90s, right? So before, you know, if you ever watch like the court shows on TV, they're always talking about smogging in California. It's because there's so many cars there that um, the smog from the car exhaust, the nitrogen dioxide, it turns out, which is a brown color, really makes the environment pretty bad. And that's actually, you know, if, if, the, if, the, if it's kind of still weather over Los Angeles for a couple of weeks in, uh, in the summer, in the 90s, that's what the, that's what the sky looks like, okay? So, and that's an equilibrium, all right? And it says show slide. So I'll show you that slide real quick. Maybe I can find it on the internet, but I got this one here, right? Okay. So it turns out that N2O4, which is a clear colorless material, right? At super cold temperatures, that's what it exists as, yeah? And then basically you take this stuff out and just put it in the room and it actually undergoes decomposition at room temperature, right? So it starts to turn brown, which is the formation of NO2, yeah? Okay, and then we have, actually it's down here, right? So if you look at the pictures and the slides, yeah, so macro, micro. So at cold temperature, it's all these molecules, N2O4s. Those N2O4s start to fall apart, so you literally break the bond between the two nitrogens and you make two NO2s, yeah? So they start to fall apart, reactant turns to product. That product is a brown color, right? So it starts to turn brown. And eventually, when it gets to the equilibrium position, we have a fixed number of products, a fixed number of reactants going between at whatever temperature it is. And there it is, so that's the sign. That sign, which is the dynamic equilibrium sign, says, hey, the forward reaction and the reverse reaction are happening at the same rate, so we have a fixed number of reactants and products at that position, right? So if we look at it, we've got one, two, three, four, five, and two O fours, right? And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and O twos. So it's a two to one ratio in favor of products. Makes sense, right? Because it's obviously quite brown in color, which kind of tells you there's more of these kind of NO2s which make the brown color. Okay, so that's an equilibrium kind of in practice. Okay, now <laughs> if you look in, uh, <laughs> if you look in the, uh, there's the sign, right? Reactants and products. That's a dynamic equilibrium sign, meaning, hey, forward and reverse reactions are happening at the same speed. There is no real uh, sign in the, well, when I wrote this at least, there might be today, I don't know, check, right? There might be a dynamic equilibrium sign in the MS Word program or not, but that's the closest. So when you see that double-headed arrow, it really means this, okay, all right. And that's the dynamic equilibrium sign. So as I mentioned, based on the slide at equilibrium <laughs> here, and the picture of the LA skyline in the 1990s, would you say the equilibrium, equilibrium lies more towards the favor of formation of products or more towards the retention of reactants? Well, we already saw from the microscopic picture, that's a 10 to five ratio. So on the microscopic level, we saw it, but in common sense, it makes sense because it's a lot browner, right? So there's more product, okay? Because it's brown. So the thing we can see has obviously emerged, right, which is the product, which is the brown colored stuff. Okay, so qualitatively, we can just say just looking at it, it's browner than it was, so we've made a bunch of product. But in terms of a quantitative analysis, it's actually a 10 to 5 ratio, right? Now we could measure that, right? So we talked actually in your recent lab, your um, 
CV lab, you were able to me measure the concentration of a colored reactant, right, by absorption, right? So we could actually figure out the concentration of NO2 in this experiment. So, you know, we could put numbers on it, right? So there are some kind of easy just counting numbers. It might be 10 moles per liter instead of 10 actual molecules. But you get the idea, right? We can measure concentrations. And if it's a gas, remember, hey, pressure, concentration, they can be used kind of interchangeably, right, when we talked about kinetics, and they can in equilibrium too, okay, because pressure is proportional to concentration for a gas. All right, so that ratio, 10 of these to 5 of these, right? It's a 2 to 1 ratio, isn't it, right? So that's what K, now be very, very careful, because K is what's called the equilibrium constant. Careful, 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 because little k, with a little kicker on the end of it, lowercase was rate constant from, you know, Arrhenius and initial rates method, right? So lowercase with a kind of a kicker, right, is for kinetics. Big uppercase is for equilibrium, okay? So there are like literally 300 symbols in science, 26 letters in the alphabet, so there's double duty or sometimes triple duty, right? So k is used a bunch of times. K is actually uppercase, equilibrium constant, and K uppercase is also Kelvin, so we've got to be careful of the context, right? Okay, so K, the equilibrium constant, is actually the ratio of products to reactants, right? So it's the concentration of products divided by the concentration of reactants, we're good to go. If we were just counting molecules, that would be a 10 to 5 ratio, which equals two, right? So, you know, just counting molecules, that's not how we really do it. We'll show you later with concentrations. But just as a, as, as a kind of an introduction to it, K would be, for example, two in that case, the amount of products to the amount of reactants. Okay, now if you think about it, because that's a fraction, if the amount of products and reactants are identical, 10 and 10, right? Any number that's the same top and bottom divides out to one. Fair enough, right? So if you think about it, because products are on top, any number for K bigger than one means we've got more products. So big Ks mean more products, and the line in the sand is the number one. <laughs> Makes sense, right? Any K less than 1.5, right, whatever, okay, means there's more reactants at equilibrium, okay? And, you know, that would mean the reaction, if you like, was less complete. So the more complete the reaction, the higher the value of K, the less of the value of K, the less complete the reaction, okay? As we've seen a little bit, there is no such thing as a complete reaction. K is just very large, okay? And there's no such thing as a non-reaction. K is just very, very small, all right? Okay, all right. Moving on. So we kind of talked about it already just a little bit, all right? How do we quantify, all right? So just based on the Definition of K, estimate the value of K for that. Well, K equals concentration of NO2 over N2O2 from our previous slide. Okay. And remember at the end here at equilibrium we had 10 NO2s and 5 undissociated N2O2s. Oh, sorry, N2O4s. Okay. So that's 10 over 5 which equals two. Fair enough, right? Again, not how we really do it in practice, but it gives you an idea where we're going. Okay, if I looked at the shoe store, <laughs> remember the shoe store, right? Where's my shoe store? Let's call it K-shoe, because why not, right? Products. Other reactants. Remember in our shoe store, there are three people in the store any one time for two people outside. Products to reactants, so that's three over two. Which equals one and a half. Okay. So, very simple. Equilibrium constant tells you the ratio of how many products over how many reactants when exchanged between the two is at equal speed. Think of that revolving door. Okay. Now, unfortunately, Unfortunately, there are some minor complications due to stoichiometry, okay? So we have to factor in, you know, stoichiometric constants when we talk about this work, okay? And that does complicate things just a little bit, but not too much, all right? So let's look down here. So here's our, <laughs> you've seen this a million times, here's our generic reaction, right? A of A reacts with B of B to get into equilibrium with, you know, I should have that sign there, right, really. 
C of C and D of D. So it's not just the concentrations of the reactants, it's the stoichiometry to the power of that concentration, okay? So it's, yes, products over reactants. So I'm multiplying the concentration of, if there's multiple products, multiply the concentration of the products. C plus D relates to C times D. So it's almost like it's upper kind of or, um, a function, right? So we're added here, we're multiplying down here, right? But then, because I'm multiplying, hey, A moles of A and B moles of B, C moles of C, D moles of D, that's raised to the power. So the stoichiometric constant actually raised to the power of reactant and product which it relates to. So products over reactants, C's and D's over A's and B's, products, reactants, and then, you know, raised to the power of the stoichiometry essentially, yeah. So we've got to do that, right? So we've got to use that equation, all right, to find the value of K. As we see later, you can use moles per liter or pressures, yeah? Okay, let's pretend we're using moles per liter. So K equals, let's use the example here, right? So I've got products, which is NO2. It's concentration of NO2, but it's squared because there's two of them, right? divided by, well there's only one N2O4 in that balanced equation, concentration of N2O4, you know, that macroscopic, microscopic kind of view does hold. There is a two to one ratio, right? So it could be 10 moles per liter and five moles per liter, right? It could be, it could be, you know, as long as it's doubled, yeah? Let's assume it's 10 and five, but these are products and there's 10 of them, but it's 10 squared over five, yeah, okay, because it was two NO2s, concentration of NO2 squared. There were 10 molecules, which I'm just saying is 10 moles per liter. The other one was five, 10 squared over five, 100 over five, 20. So obviously 20 is not the same as two, right? Okay, like we saw earlier, but you get the idea how we kind of just factor in, literally factor in the complication with the stoichiometry, okay? So as long as you're okay with this definition, equilibrium, you know, it's pretty much the same every time. We use the equilibrium definition to figure out either K or concentrations just by algebra, okay? So it's a pretty straightforward thing at the end of the day, okay? Now, this one, still a big positive number, still a number bigger than one. So both lie in favor of products. This is just putting more of a you know, a more quantitative spin on it. Okay. So, as we mentioned, works for gases too because pressure is proportional to concentration, as we saw with rate stuff, right? Okay. It's in my sheet over here. Okay, so you can use partial pressures instead. So, if you want to use partial pressures instead, we just use P instead of concentration. So, we call that KP though, right? So, if, you're, cause K, if it's just K, right? K, that's really what we call Kc, right? And we never really write the C though because 99% of the time we're talking about concentrations, right? So K is really Kc, right? And that's the equilibrium constant when we talk about concentration. However, Kp, if we did work out Kp, we'd have to put a little P there because that's the unusual one, right? So this, these are kind of pseudonyms, K is, and Kc, they're the same thing. If someone says to you K, it's really Kc, right? But if they say Kp, it's the equilibrium constant calculated with pressure. Okay, and if we think about it, it's going to be, well, we had, let's just go back, we're going to go by analogy, right? So we had this product squared and this one to the first power, if you like, because it's a one to two ratio, reactant to product, but I'm going to go partial pressure squared of NO2 over the pressure of NO, oh, N2O4. Okay, so it's the same form, right? I just I've used pressure, a little p instead of concentration, and you tend to square by the P, not over here, okay? So, you know, it is, for all intents and purposes, exactly the same math. You're just using pressures instead of concentrations, okay? Is it possible to mix and, mix and match? Yes, it is. In some reactions, you'll have things dissolve. So if you've got, you know, this is typically associated with aqueous reactants and products, isn't it? If you think about it, concentration, moles per liter, aqueous, right? Pressures, typically with a gas, yeah? But in some reactions, you have gases and <laughs> solutions. If you get an unusual case like that, you can mix and match, right? Okay. It kind of depends on how K is defined, but for this one, well, let's actually look at something quite important before we answer this question, right? So yeah, aqueous and gases have concentrations, essentially moles in a liter, yeah. 
But does that apply to solids? No, because it's a pure material, right? It's not dissolved in anything. So solids and pure liquids, it turns out, don't have a defined concentration. So they don't appear in equilibrium expressions. That's very, very important. So pure solids and liquids. So if you see an S state symbol or an L state symbol, just scratch it out because it's not going to appear in your equilibrium expression, right? So they don't appear because they don't have measurable defined concentrations. So if I look at this one here, I've got a solid, a gas, a solid, a liquid, and a gas. So the only ones I can actually measure in terms of determining K are the gases, because that's a liquid, not an aqueous. That's a solid, that's a solid, right? So K would be Kp in this case, because they're both gases. Products, one, CO2, over, careful there, HCl, but there's two of them, squared. Okay, careful, all right? So we don't think about that, that, or that in an equilibrium expression because they have no defined concentrations. Okay, have to be a gas or a solution. You can measure concentrations. Okay, all right. The good thing about this, uh, before I go any further, the nice thing about this work is, um, you know, once you've got the basic idea of what an equilibrium is, it's just variations on the theme. And what this first packet does, it kind of sets you up with the basics, okay? So it's kind of a shorter packet, which is nice. I'm probably not going to go too much over half an hour with this one, <laughs> unlike the last ones, which I know tend to drag on a little bit. So this one's a nice kind of shorter introduction. So, you know, you've got a bit of a shorter week this week, which is nice. Okay, so let's get back to it. Now, one of the most famous equilibria of all time is this one. The reaction between nitrogen and gas, which is, you know, 79% like, of the air, so it's very abundant, right? Hydrogen gas, which you can just get by putting electrical current through water. So two readily available reactants, hydrogen gas and nitrogen gas, right? From water and air, right? You can actually react them, right? In what's called the Haber process. This is called the Haber process. I think it's Fritz Haber, could be, right? He has um, an institute named after him in Berlin, the Fritz Haber Institute, I believe it is. Okay, so this is actually dating back to the 19, early 1900s, right? So the time of World War I, uh, the glorious British Navy, <laughs> right, which was the biggest Navy at the time, were blockading the German ports during World War I. So the Germans weren't able to import fertilizer which was actually guano. And if you know anything about guano, it's actually bird poop. <laughs> and it comes from the Canary Islands, right, off Spain, essentially, right? Okay, so these boats weren't able to get the bird poop back to Germany for the German farmers to use as fertilizer, all right? And that was a problem for the German economy. So they ask, you know, Fritz Haber to um, come up with a synthetic fertilizer and did an awesome job, okay? So he was able to make the active ingredient for fertilizer, which is ammonia, from basically air and water. How genius is that? Okay. So, interesting story with Fritz Haber. He was, uh, you know, between the wars, he was like idolized, right? Because he'd uh, come out with this process of making a uh, synthetic fertilizer. And then uh, in the late 1930s, he actually became a Nazi. And I think he was eventually tried for war criminals. <laughs> so, yeah, so he kind of turned a bit south at the end there. But, uh, you know, he still has an institute in Berlin. Okay. So, here, basically, if you want to find K, for a system, Kp in this case, right, because we've got gases, you just plug and chug, right? So we're going to write, let's read the question, find K for the system, assuming these pressures exist at equilibrium, right? So they're giving you the equilibrium partial pressures. So K, and we call Kp, equals the pressure of the product. Well, actually, uh, why don't I just do the first one for you, right? So I'm going to stop there for a second, right? So I've got one nitrogen as a reactant, three hydrogen as a reactant, and two ammonia as a product. Products over reactants, remember the stoichiometry, just finish off this equilibrium, we call it expression, right? So what goes on the bottom? Just pause me, come back. All right, you're back. So one and two multiplied by, right? If you add here, you multiply, multiply by H2 to the power of three, because it's three of them. All right, just put the numbers in. Again, you can, you know, stop me. Just put these numbers in, squared, cube when appropriate, and you'll get a value for Kp, right? So let's look, ammonia is 0.166 atmospheres squared. It's not really necessary to put the units because K is always unitless, but you know, you can put them in if you want. Nitrogen, 
2.46 atm, not squared because or cubed because it's just one. But hydrogen is cubed, so that's hydrogen, which is 7.38 atm cubed. If you work that out, what you get in class, I'd you know reward the first five people to running come running up to the front with the right answer. It's actually 2.79 times 10 to the minus five. Ah, interesting. Let's just do that as a real number. One, two, three, four. It's approximately that, right? <laughs> just as, as easy reckoning as that, right? That's a number much less than one, isn't it? So what does that mean in terms of our original conversation? Because the ratio is less than one by a, a big margin here, right? That means it lies entirely almost to the left. What does that mean? Well, it means I got more reactants and products when it's at equilibrium. Right? If that was a shoe store, there's 100 people outside and two people inside. Well, it's actually worse than that, isn't it? It's probably <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. There's 10,000 people outside and one person inside. <laughs> That's the ratio, right? Okay. Now, when I see that, numbers like this, I like to do this, right? So I like to kind of do that and then that, that. You'll never see that in the book. I just put like a big arrow going that way. It says to me, hey, there's more reactants and products at equilibrium. We say the equilibrium lies to the left. There's more reactants and products. Okay. So that number's real, real small. So yeah, Pat Fritz Albert on the back for his genius invention. <laughs> but you're getting very, very, very little ammonia from this process, okay? Now, later in the course, we'll talk about how you can make things better, right? So you can get a reasonable amount of ammonia out of this if you play tricks with the equilibrium. But just as a straight equilibrium, you get next to no ammonia out of this, right? So that's worth thinking about as we go forward. All right, got a couple of minutes left before my buzzer goes off. Just enough time to introduce you to this one, all right? So, sorry, before we go on, so if you know the partial pressures or concentrations at equilibrium, you can just throw them in the expression and get an answer, as we just saw there, okay? So you can work out the value of K if you know all the concentrations or pressures at equilibrium. All right, so if you know that, all right, so you can work out equilibrium constant from concentrations or pressures, which we just did, or you can go the other way, you can work out concentrations or pressures from K sometimes, all right? And that is our next example, which is kind of an interesting one, right? So I'm about to come up to the break, but I'll show you the trick before we do, and then, you know, we'll come back after the break and solve it, right? So you have, oh, this stuff is unpleasant, right? So <laughs> I don't know if you know, but H2S is that rotten egg smell, and NH3 is that really nasty ammonia smell that like you get from cleaning fluids sometimes. That's actually, that'll <laughs> that's actually used in smelling salts, you know? Smelling salts. <laughs> If you're unconscious and smell it, it wakes you up. If you're conscious and smell it, it knocks you out. <laughs> so careful, right? So that's ammonia, okay? And so that's kind of like really pungent kind of smell. And so is that one, right? So kind of, kind of a really unpleasant mixture of gases there, all right? So I'll talk about it when I come back. Okay, see you in a second. All right, so we're back. Now, this is an example of what we call a heterogeneous equilibrium. Okay, so we have this nasty material, this ammonium hydrogen sulfide, right? That's what it's called, right? It's ionic, right? So that's ammonium hydrogen sulfide, right? And then it basically, it's volatile, right? It's got a very low boiling point, so it will kind of evaporate by itself, essentially. It has a low vapor pressure, right? Okay, so if we put some of this in a jar like this, yeah. So there's my little cube or little grain of ammonium hydrogen sulfate, or sulfide rather, right? Okay. Now, this gets into an equilibrium with its, these two gases, yeah? Now, it's called a heterogeneous equilibrium because this guy's a solid and these guys are gases, yeah? All right. So, these will have a pressure because they're gases, okay? But this one will not appear in the equilibrium because it's a solid. It doesn't have a defined pressure or concentration, yeah. So that, it's interesting, it's very interesting, right? This equilibrium would not happen unless this solid was there because it's a reactant, right? So you throw this little grain of stuff in there, put the lid on, and the gas starts to get into an equilibrium. But that gas wouldn't have appeared unless the solid was there, okay? So it has to be there, it has to be there to make the equilibrium established. It's just not counted in the math, if that makes sense, because it's a solid, right? So if we think about that, what does K equal here, right? Kp equals products over reactants, right? So it's going to be the pressure of NH3, there's one of them, times the pressure of 
H2S is one of them, divided by, now did anybody write the, the pressure or concentration of this underneath? You don't write it underneath, right, because it's not measurable. So it's actually just that, isn't it? Now here's the trick, right, here's the trick. The equilibrium is known to be that, right? So K, when I says K, let's just write that K. K equals, let's just say it's Kp, right? Just to make it sort of consistent. Kp equals 7.0 times 10 to minus 2. Here's the trick, yeah? Look at this. Because I make one of these and one of those, I make equal amounts, right? So therefore, K equals, if I just say the constant the pressure of these is X, it's X times X, yeah? which equals x squared. So x, which equals the concentrate, oh sorry, the pressure of NH3, which also equals the pressure of H2S, equals, move that around, square root of k. Square root of, you can figure it out, 7.0 times 10 to the minus 2, which equals 0.26. Okay, a little trick there, right? Oftentimes we'll see that, so we can set these, there's, there's a very famous one we'll do in lab later, right? But um, sometimes the math works nicely and you can actually go from K to concentration, but it has to be kind of a, kind of a unique setup in terms of stoichiometry. We'll see a few more of those examples later, okay? All right. Talked about it already. Feasibility of a reaction. So now we're answering the, this is classic, right? This is a classic kind of chemical engineer's question. Well, yeah, you got this equation, thank you, research chemist, but how much stuff are you gonna make? You're gonna make me a profit? Am I gonna make any product on this, right? Okay, so what does the value of K really mean? Like as we said, if K is very large, because remember K equals product over reactant, if K is large, lots of products. <laughs> so, so that's what we call a complete reaction. If K is super big, we make loads of products. That's our standard chemical reaction. So it's not really, right? So we only choose examples in chemistry labs with big Ks because you make lots of product, right? <laughs> what would be the point of throwing things in the jar and don't make anything, right? That's when K is small. If K is small, Lots of prod, lots of reactants rather, reactants. Okay, so that's really what K is all about. Remember, K is a ratio of products to reactants. If K is big, lots of product. If K is small, very little product turns from reactants, and there's lots of reactants, if that makes sense, okay? Now, when we talk about complete reactions, a million, right? A million is the line in the sand. So 10 to the six, if K is 10 to the six or bigger, we generally call that a you know, our reaction. So 10 to the 6 is 10 to the 6 over 1, right? That means I've got a million products to one reactant at equilibrium. So it's essentially all product, isn't it, right? If it's the other way around, 10 to the minus 6, <laughs> that means I've got a million reactants and one product. That's called a non-reaction, right? So there's no such thing really as a complete reaction and a non-reaction, because if you think about it, that would mean that, and I'm talking about the next part here, that would mean that K was infinity, right? Or one over infinity, which is close to zero, isn't it, right? But there's no, you know, you can get to the philosophical discussion of infinity, but there's, you know, in practical terms, there is no such thing as infinity, right? So it's more of a theoretical limit, yeah? So where do we draw the line? Well, we say 10 to the six, 10 to the minus six for reaction and no reaction. So if your K is somewhere in between those, all right, in that range, 10 to the six, 10 to the minus six, you know, that's something we'd look at, right? So that's somewhere in between, somewhere between react, full reaction and no reaction. Okay, so <laughs> given the above information, is there such a thing as a complete or incomplete reaction? No, <laughs> okay. It's just that it's just pointless measuring past 10 to the six plus or minus because it's such a, you know, it's so close to finished, it's not worth thinking about. It's so close to not reacting, it's not even worth thinking about, million to one, right? Okay. I think, yeah, that's the end of the packet. If you, end of the packet, uh, in a, oh, there's some nice um, kind of equilibrium in the back you can look at. There's a heterogeneous, uh, that's pretty much it. So, have a look at this one if you can before uh, Wednesday, kind of a short one. Any questions, office hour, and of course discussion. See you guys next time.